Okay, we are recording. Well, hello. <laughs> hello to you too. Uh, right, so uh, I wanted to give this talk uh, sort of early on at Orion, just so I'm all sort of familiar with what I've been doing, what my background is. So, um, as most of you know, I guess I'm a neuroscientist by training, an experimental neuroscientist, and I did my PhD in a short postdoc in Peter Keller's lab in Basel at the Friedrich Mischer Institute. Um, and the whole idea is that we work on the predictive processing in sensory cortex. And so, the idea, I mean, the idea isn't, isn't to like show that predictive processing is true, of course, it's like, let's take this forward as a hypothesis, see how far it can go. So uh, the way that at least I think about this philosophically is that, you know, the brain sort of exists in a little black box, right? So we're, uh, you might, many of you have might have read like philosophical papers about this, right? So we have like, we're sort of detached from the outside world in many ways, there is no like outside world or the outside world that our brain creates. And it has access to, let's say, um, yeah, so we have like an internal world of like sensory states and internal states. And let's say there's something interesting in the external world uh, and we want to interface with it, right? So, you know, we can use like our eyes, our noses, um, sense of touch, and all these things feed back into the brain. So the brain only has access to these things, that's this bridge to the outside world, and of course it has access to its own internal states. So, how does it do this? How do we like, how are we able to do anything at all, right? So the leading, the prevailing theory since, uh, well, I mean, it goes experimentally at least to the 50s and 60s with uh, uh, Hugo and Weasel's work um, is that sort of uh, we have this little Lego block model, uh, which I'm sure like all of you are familiar with this idea that there's, there's like, okay, let's say there's a hierarchy in cortex and that, you know, there's like V1, for example, the primary visual cortex just looks at a little thing. It has like a little receptive field somewhere and it has, um, it really likes that when there's a little bar or a dot or something and it's in this direction versus another direction. And then you could like pool a number of these cells uh, and you can get like more complex representations. So when these two cells are active, you can get like a little track, you know, a little angle or something. And then you could just like arbitrarily superimpose these things until you get like, um, more complex shapes. And you know, there is some evidence to support this. We have things like the, the fusiform face area, where we like, you know, it responds a lot to faces. And humans also in tools and stuff. Uh, but the thing is like a lot of actually the majority uh, I would say of you know, our experimental data and how we seem to like uh, behave in the world isn't really consistent with this idea. Uh, we we seem to like fill in a lot of things that are not really there uh, in in the outside world, and uh, you know, you, I don't think you could explain this just by saying, "Oh, this is something that some emergent property of like stacking a lot of these like increasing these big receptive fields together." I don't think. Um, so, uh, and you know, one of the, one example of this is the sensory illusions, for example, visual illusions being the most uh, um, compelling. So, um, you know, so the, the idea is like, okay, maybe there's some truth to this, but what happens the other way back? We would need a sort of way, a more efficient way to do this would be to say, okay, we have this knowledge about the world, how do we compare it uh, to the sort of fine grail, fine grained uh, detail we have of the world? Um, <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite illusions to show. How many of you are seeing this rotate counterclockwise? Okay, I guess everyone's watching. I, I can get into both ways. <laughs> can you just yeah. do it mentally? Yeah. Okay, I've never been able to do it at will. Really? I've yeah. flipped it at the once. Well, yeah, I, I've done it, it once. Well, yeah. it flipped on me. Whether I did it well or not, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it okay. flips on me too, but I, have, I can't. Like, but yeah, usually the majority of people seem to uh, see it spinning uh, clockwise uh, for some reason every time I've given the talk, at least. So, uh, you know, we, we force uh, knowledge onto the world down to our perception of it. Yeah, not the other way around. That's cool, right? Um, so, you know, so this, uh, but this, you know, this also means that we detect patterns where there aren't necessarily any. Um, and this, I think, is like a very big, uh, a basic cornerstone of how we, of how, uh, of how we work as a species. Um, so, you know, as many of you know, the one of the founding fathers of the idea of mental models is uh, Kenneth Craig, who's a contemporary of Alan Turing. And he sort of detailed this idea of having, carrying around a small scale model of reality and you can use this to sort of like a little physics model where you can like simulate various alternatives, see which ones are nicer than others, uh, react to future situations before they arise, uh, you know, 
these tend to be a lot more uh, verbose, those writings from the early century. That's a nice quote. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's see how the things like how do we implement this is all like a lovely idea, but how, how do we, you know, can we look at like a sort of model uh, of how this can work? So one uh, old notion is the, the notion of efferent copies. So this comes from like engineering. Uh, and also, like, you know, it's an old idea in neuroscience as well. So this allows me to do things like close my eyes and reach for my water bottle without, you know, having the, the sensory feedback. So you, I need to have a 3D model uh, of the world to do this. So, you know, a uh, simple way uh, that you could do this. So is there like a laser? My mouse has just disappeared. Anyway. Um, and that shows up there. Oh, the, oh yeah, you look there. Cool. Yeah. A simple way to do this um, is, you know, just take this, like, control theory scheme and say, okay, you have a... Uh, you produce a movement, and that movement generates a sensory feedback. But also you have a, an efference copy, so this is just a copy, uh, basically, of your motor output, but it's sort of the difference is that it's sort of transformed into the coordinates of the sensory input, otherwise this won't work. Uh, and then, you know, you can compare those two and have a little error uh, if there's a mismatch, and then that you can use that error to update your motor output online, or you can use it to learn something about, you know, the environment. So uh, this is basically what predictive coding is, right? It is that you make predictions uh, and you compare them to sensory input and you generate error signals. So what are the necessary components to do this? Uh, so predictions, right? The, like I said, they need to be in target coordinates. And then experimentally, you know, to create a prediction needs to be learned and malleable, right? You can't just like wake up you know, sort of what we were talking a little bit earlier. Exactly, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you need to be able to alter them with time, with experience. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'd also have local predictions, so not, like, necessarily long-range projections uh, and stuff. And... Um, like local in terms of local long-range what? Sorry, right, so so let's say you're looking at V1. Yeah. Right, so we're looking at V1. So are predictions coming only coming into V1 uh, distally? From other cortical areas, or just view one generated. Some projections in the brain. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other component is uh, error signals. So these should be uh, because neurons can't take uh, the absolute of something. At least that's not known to be a computation. They could do it. You need to have positive and negative types, being meaning that like is your prediction stronger than your sensory input, or is your sensory input stronger? Right, because otherwise, you know, you just have like a zero. Because everyone gets this right, um, and the, ideally, they should be directional. The idea is that the, it shouldn't just be like, oh, there's an error here. Deal with it. The error should be in sort of like in a vector space uh, in the coordinates of the uh, sensory motor uh, model. Right, so it's like you're off by, you know, ten percent. I like argue that is true sometimes, but I wouldn't think it's true everywhere. Well, we have some preliminary data that shows. Uh, that it's a case in like in a simple model. Yeah, I see some places I would think. <laughs> sure, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm, just, I'm laying this on top of all the stuff we've done here and all the stuff we know what I'm talking about. That was, that was one I would say sometimes, but mm -hmm. not always. So I'm just pointing out that are we just, just sharing knowledge what we have around here. So. But in what, in what ways would it not uh, always uh, Well, you can think of it in terms of motor stuff, it may be always directional. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, if I hit the wrong note in the melody, mm -hmm. What's the direction I'm supposed to go? Is it directional to the air? Oh, it's like a, you can think of it like as a just frequency space. But, but uh, maybe not. There's, there's no, it, 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 may, it, it could be just, if I have the wrong, if I have the wrong word in a quote, mm -hmm. what's the direction? Then you say, well, it's the direction of the correct word, but what is that? You know, that's a, it's Right, a, I see, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it sort of yeah. implies kind of a scalar quantity yeah. and a scalar. Well, you so said that, you said a scale, well, you didn't use that word, but you, you did say something like so scalar. Yeah. Yeah. Vector. Yeah. And, and I'm arguing that we, we have a different idea that we view things as always being in these uh, sparse representations, which can represent mm -hmm. vectors, but they can also represent non-vector uh, quantities. And, and you basically, you, your error can be which bits in that, in that representation are wrong. So mm -hmm. it can be a, be a, um, a, a semantic error. Mm -hmm. Because the bits are semantic meaning, mm -hmm. not vector meanings. Uh, so you can still know what part of your prediction is wrong. Like that's not that word is the wrong word because it's referring to a color, and it shouldn't be referring to this. Or that word is the wrong word because it's the wrong uh, tense of speech. Um, but I wouldn't call those vectors. I would call those semantic parsing parts of the part of the representation that are incorrect. 
I don't. Let's not get hung up on it. Sure, sure. No, I mean, I, I mean, just you know, I'm still learning about uh, yeah. of what you guys are doing. Yeah. Right. And then one, you know, nice quality uh, you, that uh, they can have is sort of correlate with confidence or precision in terms of like uh, how Carl Friston talks about it. So you know, you want to have like stronger error signals when you're more confident, but it, you're wrong, right? Uh, for example, or if you're like anything can happen, your error signals that reflect that. So. Um, so there was, yeah, I, love, uh, I lost some of the videos here in the talk, unfortunately. So this is a video of a, a mouse, uh, yeah, I put it in a, video, a mouse running. This is like Georg's original experiment um, in his postdoc, where there's just like um, a moving grading that could, is coupled to how the mouse moves on this little suspended styrofoam ball. Yeah. And then sometimes you uh, remove the coupling. And then when you remove the coupling, you get this enormous response in visual cortex, this population response in the visual cortex, uh, which is a feedback mismatch. And this is not explained just by like the visual halt itself. So if the mouse is, run, is still or if it's running at like a different sort of speed or randomly, when this halt happens, uh, you, you don't really see anything at all. It's called the playback halt here. It's the yellow thing. Playback, so this is the traditional visually evoked response is very low. And then, you know, the second highest response is just running in darkness, right? So this is one thing that uh, is also bananas. It's just like the most active you get visual cortex to be is when the there's it's nothing there. to yeah. see. Yeah. So that's fascinating. I, I it is. Like, I highlighted that more. I, I mean, like the, the way that we think about it, yeah, I can imagine it, but I don't think people talk much about that, mostly because it doesn't fit the paradigm. Yeah, so there's a lot of sensory uh, cortex being all about sensory processing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know? It seems to be yeah doing random things. So the uh, there was yeah, none of this matches the feed forward model at all. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and there's some interesting things about it. So, for example, the majority population of cells that are active at running in darkness are sort of orthogonal to the ones that are run, uh, there when there's visual things happening when the lights are off. Um, so it uh, doesn't really fit as far like doesn't neatly even fit the predictive coding model where you're like, oh, are these predictions and also sort of dreaming of like you know like when I have walk around with my eyes closed, I can sort of visualize what I'm doing. Right. Is it that? And then there's just the absence of sensory input to compare it against. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, at, at least easily, you can't really say that that's what's happening. Um, so what I, my project, my PhD project was to sort of take this idea and sort of uh, take it to a different domain where you could actually see predictions. Because the idea is if you're making sensory motor predictions, the predictions will almost look, uh, unless you're using like very high temporal resolution, you know, electrophysiological recording, uh, they will be concurrent to the sensory input, right, if, for them to work at all. So you want something where they're slower, they precede it. And uh, I think the um, notion of, uh, of space... Slower or precede it? You are absolutely right. Uh, slower. Slower? <laughs> yeah, or noisier, let's say. So you want something that... So space, the, the idea is that, like, you know, if you look at the firing of a grid cell or a play cell, it's not like, it's not a delta function, right? Yeah. It's sort of spread out. Why, why do you expect your prediction to be slow? Uh, I, I can see why your prediction should proceed, uh, but why would it be slower? So the okay. idea is that you could see that it's a prediction. So either way, it would proceed it, right? So the thing is that, like, the let's say you have a, a play cell fired and you have, like, your predictions are made by a simple heavy model where it's like a concurrence of visual input and, like, a place, right? Mm -hmm. So then, where this sort of, if your prediction, if you send a prediction as, you know, this play cell is active, it sends the prediction through some area saying, oh, you're about to see this. Where is it that this starts? Is it like exactly Okay, this? so if I were thinking about like a melody, uh, I am now predicting the next note in the melody. Mm -hmm. I have a sense not only what the next note is, but mm -hmm. when it occurred. But I would agree with you that the window over my prediction should be wider than the actual mm -hmm. window which the event occurs, mm -hmm. but not by a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, good musician has a pretty damn precise expectation when the note's going to come. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, that's why it's hard. You know, the, the you, you, people do this in the bird songs, for example, but there, you know, the feedback is extremely fast. Uh, and so your prediction needs to be like very, very tightly coupled. But in space, you know, it's kind of vague because we never. Right, in space, I get it. I guess yeah. I'm just I'm making the argument that I'm not sure it's a universal property. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely uh, is. I mean, when yeah. I think about grid cells, you're right. But if I think about timing of events, um, no, uh, that's absolutely true, right? Uh, the idea would be just sorry. Go on. Yeah, and there's also you might be also talking about something. You might have mentioned something else as well, which is the system has to know what is a prediction and what is reality. Yeah. Um, and is that what you meant as well? That 
it has failed to distinguish between the two, and that's why one is slower? Or? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, no, I haven't thought of that. Um, okay. okay. I, I thought you said that, but I that. I don't know how much you know about the work we've done here. Um, Sorry? I don't know how much you know about the work we've done here. Uh, how much you've read your papers. I, I have no idea how much you know. He's going about through the papers. stuff right now. Okay. <laughs> I've read the papers before, but I'm Okay, so now, yeah. the very first question we really, one of the first questions we tried to address here was, uh, what is the nature of prediction? Where mm -hmm. does it occur? Mm -hmm. You know, is, is there one set of cells that are making a prediction and another set of cells that are actually um, um, getting the actual input? Are they multiplexed in time? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer we came up with is in the, we call the neuron paper, why neurons have thousands of synapses, I don't know if you've read that, mm -hmm. but, but uh, we think that neurons are every parental cell actually making predictions of its own input, but most of those predictions are internal, and therefore you're not, you're not even aware of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's an interesting question when we talk about, you know, the first question that I wanted to answer when we talk about the brain making predictions, which I agree, the brain's making predictions about everything all the time, mm -hmm. is where are, what is the manifestation of the right, right. physical manifestation? And although sometimes we are consciously aware of our predictions, the vast majority of the time we're not. Absolutely. And uh, so, and that's the reason the explanation is they're internal. So then when you talk about the predictions being slower or broader, it depends on the type of prediction. Many of those predictions are just within the neuron itself, and it's kind of hard to say it's slow. They don't even have an activation signature. They don't have an they external don't activation signature. Although, although the, the, the NMDA-based depolarization is, is much broader than the spike type. It is. It is, but it, it is a sustained But it's interesting, when, if you're going to look for a neural correlates of prediction, it's easy to find neural correlates of misprediction. You saw that in the previous picture, right? The, the, yeah, the animal's ball. Yeah. And, and you see them all over the place. But we are making predictions every practically damn millisecond in our lives about everything. Absolutely. And, and yeah. most of those do not have a manifestation external to the neurons. It's like we don't believe so, I don't believe so. But most of those, the majority of those are actually happening within the neurons themselves. Well, to some extent, it's an it's an ill-posed problem because, like, what do you call a prediction versus something that's actually happened, right? So there's many ways, like, like why you said something internal to the cell that is a prediction just because it's like a response to a state. So you can just have it. No, the cell is the right? cell saying, "I'm supposed to be active in a moment here." And right, but you can take that even back further. It's just by the fact that it's active, it's like, "Oh, I predict by the fact that I'm sending an action potential." And no, my so. point is, it's not saying that. The predictions in the eternal. Oh, I understand. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm just saying you could sort of like abstract even further out and say like anything can be a prediction in some state. But uh, here I'm talking about explicit predictions uh, in terms of like cellular like, things that cellular states that uh, you know neural states that are predictions. Or signals that are predictions. So, yeah, so we yeah. call that like actual predictions. Yeah. You know, and our, yeah. Our, yeah. 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 And you could argue our good cells are that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, just, I just think that the vast majority of predictions we make in the world are not like that. I think they're, they're happening every practice, every gym, almost every, not every gym, but most of them. Um, and anyway, I just, it, uh, so I'm mean, hearing your words, I'm just trying to lay them on top of what we do, and I'm not sure. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it helps me as well. So yeah. The, the, okay. the, the, yeah. So, you know, the idea is like, you know, the, instead of uh, just taking a direct off reference copy, use your reference copy, and your sensory input to form a map of the world, right? Uh, and then you can use that again, you know, once you have a map, you can infer your location ideally, right? Like I've been in the a couple of times, I know that if I turn right, there's a bathroom or whatever. Uh, and then that can re lead right to an expected stimulus. Uh, so as opposed to just this being an expected stimulus, right? It's like, I'm gonna see this at coordinates X and Y. So that's very consistent, you know, with our Kind of idea. Yeah. yeah. Right, so oh. in the location based prediction. Okay, so unfortunately I, I uh, couldn't reproduce the, I mean the, the video was lost for seeing a mouse like run down this virtual tunnel, but the idea is that the side of the tunnel looks like this. So these are textures that are on the tunnel. Uh, and the idea is that we would have two uh, different uh, visual stimuli that, you know, gradings that would appear once the animal reached, reached them. So once the animal runs the route, you know, it's not passive, it, you know, the movement is coupled, right? Uh, and then once the animal is here, this grading will flash and stay there uh, and for the rest of the traversal, right? So that's because we want to know when exactly it sees it. Uh, and these things are, uh, we call them spatial cues, basically things that hopefully help the mouse know how far along the corridor it is because, you know, this is, if there's repeating stimuli, it's ambiguous. And then just for motivation though, this ended up being uh, annoying uh, for the reviewers. Uh, we put a little uh, water reward uh, at the end of the tunnel just to keep the mouse running. But you know, there's nothing the mouse needed to learn. There's no like interesting behavior just have to run. Um, so what we did is we changed the variability uh, of 
the grading in position five over the experiment. So this would, the first four were always stereotyped. It would be A, B, A, B, A, 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 B, A, B, sorry. And then, you know, there, we did the experiment in blocks of two days. So we always, we recorded chronically. So from the same neurons over uh, eight days, which was the total duration of the experiment. So we uh, put, we call these conditions, these are blocks of two days. Uh, we tried to make it blocks of like a certain number of traversals, but you know, mice don't always behave the way you want them to. So we tried to make it more or less consistent. So first condition, first two days, is A, it's A 100%. So it is like you learn that it's A. Then we'd make it B 10% of the time, so be an oddball stimulus. Uh, and then we'd revert to B 100% of the time, and then make the reverse flip, right, A 10% of the time. And then the final thing we did was, uh, the, you know, the last 100 or so traversals, uh, what we do is instead of showing a, a different grading, we would just not show anything at all. There's a gray screen that where the grading is, that's uh, isoluminant to the rest that of the That was two days, and that was another two days? Uh, this so was, 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 was those the last two days. Was, yeah. those, was condition five in just first condition four, or was it condition four? It was followed by condition four. So condition five is something that I fought with Garrett to do. He didn't want me to do it. Uh, and I'm just, just at the end of recording, I... I mean, by calling it a mission, mm -hmm. it implies that the animal is expecting something. Is yeah. where, you know, where you could just say, this is a different experiment, but we only had bees. So, so the, when you say it's a mission, I'm, I'm almost imagining the animal's running down, seeing A and B 10, 90% of the time, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, one time, you don't show it, and you show the blank screen. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's not the way it's shown here. You're showing it as a two-day transfer, so condition four, condition five, so did you do two days of condition four and then two days of condition five? No, no, it was two days of condition four and one day of condition five. But that's it seems like condition, condition five, five oh, does not right. seem like, that's just a new, every day, every day the animal would say, oh, what's the track going to look like today? So yeah. I, would, I wouldn't call it an emission, I would just call it, it was nine, you know, nine percent. I'm trying to say why is that, I'm assuming you're going to say that's a, uh, an error or a, a misprediction, right? Why would that? I guess I'm, I so 90% is still like pretty low variability, roughly, right? So the B is there most of the time. Yeah. So the idea is like the mouse, yeah, probably the mouse knows to some extent that there's variability here, so its predictions might be weaker. But it, B is a pretty safe bet when it does this hundreds of times, right? So but Except in condition two. Well, yes, but we reverse that, right? If I'm saying, what if I said that under condition five, I showed uh, vertical bars, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to me, that'd be just another experiment where you now have a different environment for the animal to, uh, to learn and, and say that. But calling it an emission is somehow, uh, you didn't say condition three is an emission. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm missing what, what makes it an emission versus just a new, a new like that there's a blank screen. Yeah. It's not something else. Yeah. Or, or the same. That's actually a blank screen. Okay. It's just a great, yeah, that's like just how to differentiate it from like 10% A or some other stuff. Right. So when you say nine days, it's not eight days, then it's nine days. It's nine days, yeah. Nine days. When you say 90%, 10%, is, it, is this a consistent pattern or is that a, uh, is that a probability of it? Of it? Uh, it's a probability. So oh, so if I go down the track three times, it's not going to be the same each time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with a probability of 10%, yeah. Okay. And, and these are not task variables at all. There's nothing, the, the animal could completely ignore these if it yeah, wanted to, yeah. and it just wants to get the reward. Exactly, by design, because we didn't want to conflate this with more. Yeah. Right. Right. And the point is, this is the location right before the reward. Yeah. So, yes. Oh, it's the thing oh, that lets the oh, I miss that. know I'm about to finish this and expect Oh, I missed that. This is just the very last Thing. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry that. if I was not clear about that. No, it's I one the, picture, the picture shows that you, I don't think you said those words. Uh, oh. I got it. The picture okay. has those little three things there. I got it. Yeah, yeah. So, so we only is the rest the of the last track thing. always the same? And it's yes. Just, just talking about the last thing. Yeah, got it. it. Makes yeah. much sense otherwise. All right, I didn't yeah, okay, yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, my, my bad. I don't know. That's my bad. Um, so, okay, that explains a lot. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, I didn't have a video again, but the sort of setup looked like this, right? We have uh, we project a, it's a linear environment into like a toroid screen, yeah. uh, and then the mouse is running on a suspended styrofoam ball. It gets there's a little water spout over Nyan where it gets uh, its reward, and then there's a massive two photon microscope over time. <laughs> she doesn't stress it out at all, um, but they do like to run on these setups, so. So what are the things we do? I omitted a lot of the things that I would like 
I think are really interesting because it's my baby, right? But like uh, to get cut to the chase, uh, first thing we saw, which is what well, first thing we were looking for, are predictive responses to outcomes. Typically, so here we sort of bend the tunnel. You know, instead of time, we just bend look uh, activity to space, right? Zero between zero and hundred, uh, and you can look at the traces of two neurons. These are two neurons, two different neurons in the one traversal. And one, this uh, B preferring neuron, right? Because you know they're orientation sensitive. B preferring neuron cause, sort of causally fires, uh, you know, classically in response to stimulus B, the gray one, right? It's like B comes, whoop, B comes again, whoop, and then it decays. Mm -hmm. The southern neuron, sorry, did someone had a question? Yeah, uh, so you're recording in B1, yeah. and is this uh, oh, from right, there? Yeah. There are two, three? Yes. Um, it is, uh, yeah, so this yes, is yes. calcium imaging from there too, yeah, yeah. probably, right? Yeah, because I had the video just before that, but the video was lost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So this is all calcium imaging. There's a window, uh, there's a craniotomy, there's a window above the cortex. Uh, and this is a GCAMP 6. How big is the field of view? The field of view is about uh, 100 by 150 microns. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this uh, depends on the resonance scan in this, in this mm -hmm. machine. It's, uh, so the um, so you can see this is all layer two free. We also have, uh, there's a piezo motor on the, uh, on the objective so that we get different depths, but they're, they're only separated by about like maybe 10 to 20 microns. So Absolutely. we're getting a little bit at the top of layer two three just to get some more cells. Um, and so, yeah, so another thing you see is uh, that these, uh, th there's a neuron here that sort of seems to predict stimulus B and it's not just like a random Firing thing, it actually is uh, specific to stimulus B. So then, what we can do is we can sort of uh, make an arbitrary threshold, say, like, okay, neurons that have their peak before this difference, uh, this time from the stimulus onset. Yeah, I, I, I should know this, but I've forgotten it. Which, what are you actually measuring there? Are you, are you measuring action potential? Is it a field potential? What, is, what exactly are you measuring there? Right, so these are, um, so you, you guys know how like G camp and these things work, right? So they, they bind calcium, yeah. uh, they change the configuration, they get, they um, uh, emit more, more yeah. light, right? So, uh, I, I don't recall, I mean, would you be catching dendritic spikes as well? Or is it just so we're only looking at the somata here, so, uh, or the somats. Um, so what we see are mainly the somas. We do see the dendrites in anything, but because so it's all... So it's, it's an action. Yeah. So it's, yeah, exactly. The thing is that it's like a, not exactly, I mean, it's not probabilistic, but it's chaotic in the sense that, you know, a, a single action potential will usually evoke a fluorescence, uh, you know, a sharp fluorescence onset. The thing is, like, when you have multiple action potentials, you know, because the thing is, because of the kinetics, the, it looks smooth, it curves. So you don't know how many action potentials are in between that. But you're measuring action. Yeah, it's definitely These are action. real action potentials occurring before B. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The only thing is the interpretation is like, oh, how many action potentials are there? You know, you might have missed some of them. No, that's right. Just all that. No. Um, so yeah, what we do is we we look at the you know the the stack, and then what we do is we draw a region of interest around the body of a neuron. We try to uh, omit like other neuropil stuff that may be infringing on it, and we just we take the mean of that over. Number of frames, and that's our trace. And then we do some other uh, low pass filtering and stuff on it to remove noise and um, stuff because of movement, right? There's all kinds of uh, uh, artifacts that can be there. All right, so you can broadly split your neurons into predictive and visual neurons. So these are still neurons, these must be selective to the, the visual input they're receiving, stimulus A or B in this case, right? But selective. Here, the arbitrary criterion uh, is that they are at least three times as responsive to, let's say, A as they are to B, the maximum peak. And there's, always, there's of course, an um, activity threshold so that we're not capturing magnifying noise, right? Because you can. Um, so, what you see is that you, uh, the, these neurons have been selected so that they're, uh, so there's a little bit of regression to the mean here, but uh, where? Over here, so these are that are selected to be uh, predictive in condition four, and then uh, you see that how they, they get stronger with time. You start with condition one, they're not there. Of course, there's some regression to the mean here, but uh, you know, one control for this is the fact that we did the same selection on the visual neurons, and it doesn't seem to be a real uh, trend. So you're saying this is a time based training thing, or this exactly? So, the, the main this is the sanity check to see like are these predictions there in the beginning when the mouse didn't have the time to sort of learn the environment very well. Um, 
but you can also do the same analysis with sort of mean over the, over the conditions or mean over one condition, and you don't see uh, you don't see these predictive neurons in the beginning, which is a sign check. And this is not predicting the very last thing. This is predicting stuff along the way. Yeah, because we did more conflict because there's variability. Yeah. Yes, this is a this yeah. is stuff that's constant. Yeah, right. exactly. Good for yeah. example, B prediction. Yeah, yeah. B prediction or A prediction, just for the first four ratings. What is the ratio between predicting neurons and losing them? They're one to one. Really? They're both about seven percent of the population. Seven percent. Yeah. In our recording. And what are the other? Uh, <laughs> is that dark matter? <laughs> dark matter. One thing uh, we saw a lot of were neurons that liked these uh, spatial cues, but they would respond to all of them. Spatial cues. Yeah, I call them spatial cues. Oh, so like that, little yeah. patterns. Yeah. 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 Uh, they like the spatial. They like these patterns, and they would have like a differential peak to one of them. They maybe like this one more, but they would fire very consistently all. Of them. Mm -hmm. That was like one of the big combinations. So it's not in the paper. Uh, and then yeah, there's just a lot of stuff that. You don't have time to deal with. But the data set, all oh, the data sets from the lab are online, so this is why you graduated this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm not still there. Uh, so, okay, cool. We see these things that look like uh, stimulus predictions in V1. And uh, uh, so, next follow up question is of course, like, where do they come from, right? So, there's loads of huge uh, projections into V1 from all kinds of cortical areas, much bigger, especially from a ACC and retrosplenar cortex. And those are, in terms of the number of uh, boutons or even the number of fibers, are much bigger than the projection from our LGN. Uh, so, uh, what, so we could have done ACC or retrosplenar cortex, but we just did ACC because somebody was also working on ACC and had expertise on that, and he just decided, actually, without asking me or Dave, to just do the same experiment and <laughs> recording from ACC accents and one, and he's like, here's this data. Okay, great. So uh, this video did survive, and this is what it looks like when you record axons. I guess it's a bit dim because of the, the lighting. But what you're seeing here is uh, this uh, green bar on the right is just the velocity of the animal running. Uh, and then over at the top, you have uh, the time in seconds. So, play this again. so hold on, how do you record axons? Good, the same way we record neurons. Uh, the okay. difference is, sorry, I didn't want to. So, um, your field of view, usually you need to make your field of view a little bit smaller because they're dimmer, right? Uh, but that's it, you just uh, inject your full tracing, sorry, where's the mouse? Inject the tracer in ACC. In ACC. It and then spreads through its axons into your field of view in V1. Exactly. And these happen to be in layer one of V1, so they're easy. Are those the little nodes right. along the way, are those the nodes of uh, Sorry. Are those the nodes of brain the little dots along the axons? No, uh, these are probably uh, areas with boutons. The, 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 area, the, the field of view is still lays. Oh, oh, I thought you were looking at long. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing axons. It looks like I'm seeing individual axons throughout here, right? You can see individual axons, yeah. I mean, they're, 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 they're stop at a frame yeah. that. Uh, so there's little dots along the axon. <laughs> um, Maybe that's occlusion? Of well, if these, are, if these are myelinated uh, axons, then you wouldn't see it over the whole theory, right? Well, you, because it's two photon imagery, you would, right? So, um, no, I mean, I was just assuming. Um, I mean, they're, they're almost like equally spaced along there, which reminded me of nodes are in there. You know what nodes are in there? Uh, I think that's, uh, I, sorry, I think that's an illusion. <laughs> really? I mean, it's uh, like, it's really it's it's like, it's it's like, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, like, this is dot, 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 yeah. dot, 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 and, um, dot, 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 and dot, 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 and I, it just struck me as, and you can, you know, I can, you could, you can almost, you can look at these dots and trace together where the axons are, you know, so I was just curious, like, you know, like, like bum, 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 bum. Yeah, or like, yeah, that. Well, um, yeah, so, well, that was all lit up here, but, um, so, what's your explanation for those dots? So, we think they're just active zones, um, but, you know, the things you have, um, this is a constant, this is a fluorophore, right? So, this is like a, this is just any weird, we don't know exactly how this is concentrated in the axons, it depends on the... What's the field of view here? Uh, this is about, uh, I think, like 50 by 50 microns. This whole thing? Yeah. 50 microns. So, so uh, well, myelinated fiber does two millimeters per millisecond. 
And if you have a 50 micron window, that means you pass through your entire field of view with the myelin fiber in what? By, by 40th, 40th part of a millisecond. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing is that this is not a live, this is not a voltage recording, right? The kinetics of the fluorophore is slow. Oh, yeah. So right, yeah, right. Yeah, of course. It all gets from ball with the fluorophore kind of. I have still, I have questions about it, but it's not working, so. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you have to ask Gary. Uh, the thing is, like, you know, these things are kind of like a bit of a, there's some voodoo, there's some black magic with these things. We don't really know exactly why these things work. So it just struck me as uh, one of the nodes of ring. That's what it looked like to me. And I said, oh, that would make sense, but, um, but maybe not. Just as a time check, I think, I know we wanted to start at start 12 o'clock oh, meeting, yeah, right? okay. so we have about five minutes. Um, we can do the rest we of can it. do it again on, you know, continue on Monday. Okay. So just to finish up the C part, uh, we see basically the same picture as in V1. We see uh, signals predictive and things that look like visual responses. The thing is the visual responses, one being here, this is stimulus predictive response. Uh, this is obviously the onset. Uh, they, they're never purely uh, onset responsive after learning. There's a predictive component to them, like a wrap. And in the beginning, they're all, you only get caused sort of like visual-like things. So this is condition one, this is condition four. Right, so you only get visual so, response at the beginning. So what do you make of that? So the conclusion from this for me is, uh, well, there's a, but the, the um, connection with uh, ACC is bidirectional, right? So you, you get V1 talking to ACC and the other way around. So V1 is telling ACC there's something here. And ACC is like, okay, you know, whatever. Uh, sending it back, it's like, um, so is it just a loop? Uh, I don't know, but the... The fact that these become predictive and even the visually evoked ones have a prediction, that part I'm not sure how to explain. Like, I, I mean, there's a lot of like potential, you know, need explanation you can come up for it, but I don't have like a clean one. If anyone has any ideas. Yeah, just to yeah, put this in perspective, we do a lot of work here about how a cortical column models things and makes predictions, but it wouldn't fall under this paradigm. This is a, a paradigm that, you know, we think B1 is in doing inherent predictions, like these, uh, so mm -hmm. the, the, what do they call it? In the, Cell responds during the saccade. Um, saccade remapping. Remapping, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that could all happen in V1 itself. Mm -hmm. But this is a pattern that I wouldn't expect that to be. This is one that would require, I'm just making the distinction of mm -hmm. different types of prediction. This is one that is happening over a long period of time. It's, uh, it's a higher order sequence that's learned maybe somewhere else in the brain and, and it's leading to a visual prediction, but it's not the visual cortex itself modeling the world. Um, and I'm just making the distinction for our model, I don't think would apply to this mm -hmm. situation. Well, I mean, ACC could still in our model be sending sort of voting. It could be, I'm just saying that, I mean, but I, there's a general belief, a lot of people don't, don't believe V1 does much, right? Um, and we think it does as much as every place else, but it does it at a local scale, and small scale in time and space, and that wouldn't qualify here, right? So um, I'm just pointing that out. I'm trying to map our models onto this and say, oh no, our models wouldn't, we don't require, our models don't require somebody projecting that you want to make predictions, but again, we're not trying to model this kind of behavior. Exactly, right? So, there, I mean, there's so many ways that you could have things like, it could even be like compressing, right? Like you could be like a one neuron could or one column can like predict its adjacent column is going to be very similar and you could sort of... I mean, no, we're saying are, we, we, we think all columns are doing a central order prediction, every single column. Absolutely, right? Yeah, so, so even in a one single column, it can predict what its next input is going to be under, under many conditions. But this is not one of those conditions. Yeah. That's all I want to point out. Is like I'm trying to I try to correlate all research and I want to see if there's something here. That's I mean, it, it, that might still be here. It's just that the data wouldn't show it because it might be layer six, you know, making predictions. It could be, but here he's showing that these these projections from ACC are predictive projections. Yeah. And so I think there's an underlying assumption that that's where the prediction is coming from. And now V1 is is. A manifestation of that prediction. Well, of course, as a scientist, you have to be cautious, right? So, uh, of course, you know wh where we think predictions come locally would be one is layer five, uh, not layer six. And we're like, yeah, you know, this is just one potential source of predictions. You probably, if you if you if you uh, reported from a retrospinal cortex projections to be one, you probably see the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's messy. Biology is messy in these like ways that are not intuitive. Well, I just there's a uh, huge thing. A lot of people just don't think one does anything, and it's therefore therefore. If you're going to have remapping, or if you're going to have some prediction, it's yeah. got to be coming from someplace else. And I think V1 researchers tell me that, and I don't believe it's true. No, it's true. I mean, the, the field is still a little bit uh, 
I'd say old. <laughs> it's not. Traditional. It's a bit traditional. Uh, but no, yeah, well, we don't necessarily think that, but we, we do see that, you know, we know that these are um, things that happen in, um, the ACC is in the mouse is largely a motor area, right? Uh, and we see a lot of things in some other sensory motor coordinates that look like predictions coming from ACC. So that was going to be one of my next slides. Uh, but one thing I want to show you uh, when it comes to... Um, I don't want to short circuit this, because I think we do want to go through the... Absolutely. Uh, so but this just ties directly, if okay, just like yeah. one, it ties directly to what I mentioned before uh, about uh, predictions being in V1. So we, you know, in the omission paradigm I showed you earlier, you see this thing that looked like the slide in the introduction, the figure in the introduction, where you have this mean visual evoked response, and then you have this huge omission response. This is a population response. Uh, and you have neurons that are, let's say, selective to the emission. But then if you look at the ACC axons, they do not care about the emission. Mm -hmm. So it seems that like, the error is locally computed in V1. Yeah. So what does that say if, the, if there are predictions locally computed in V1? Uh, um, we don't know. Yeah. Oh, and, that is, I, that's cool because it's not consistent with the paradigm. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the very first control slide paradigm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is. I mean, you, you just don't know where the predictions are coming from, right? Right, yeah. But the thing is, the uh, another thing is that it's not in this talk. We see, like, we just compare, it's like a sort of hand wavy comparison, but we can compare the, in any one tri trial, right, in any one traversal, we can compare the activities of stimulus predictive cells and visually evoked cells and see, like, oh, is there, like, a, you know, when, uh, when you have, like, a strong prediction and you, slip, and you flip the grading, is the visually evoked prediction stronger because it's not as predictive? You predicted the opposite, right? Kind of like a silly surprise. It's like more surprising, mm -hmm. right? So that seems to be the case uh, when you look at within V1. You just have these things that are, uh, and also the case with the emission when you have a stronger uh, prediction that there's going to be a stimulus there, you have like a bigger error response. Uh, but that's not the case in ACC axons. So that, that could be something that some part of the prediction is computed within V1. Uh, but that's again like it's not a very tight uh, no. experiment for that. No. I mean, but this is just a raw population response. It doesn't say anything about what can be decoded from that you know, first of activity that you see there. That massive population response you see during uh, vision. I have a video. So first, yeah, is when you see V5. So it's time zero over there. There's the. Uh, That's well, great. Now you get the sense of what yeah. this tunnel looks like visually. Uh huh. So there, this is now is the emission. Yes, yeah, oh, time is so fast. It's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> we are so slow animals. <laughs> but let's get into this more on, on Monday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Oh. So let's we understand the paradigm now properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hopefully. Yeah. And uh, feel free to shoot questions, in, whatever. And what percentage of the neurons really have this emission response? Uh, it's also around five percent. Now I haven't okay. read my own paper in a couple of years, so <laughs> but it's less than ten percent. Right. Uh, there are around ballpark the standards. Yeah. You uh, are yeah, ready for your presentation? Uh, I just have to start recording. Okay.